Insightful Teaching with Jacob Prash on Moriel TV, where God is my teacher. Okay, dear friends, greetings in Jesus, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I was reading from the Latin Vulgate when we did part one of Zephaniah, uh, and it's interesting that the Roman Catholic Church includes the book of Zephaniah in its requiems, in its funeral liturgy. Uh, not that I have any admiration for the Roman Catholic Church, but the tradition of using Zephaniah as a book of doom and gloom is very ancient. It goes back probably to the fourth century. Dies irde dies ila, dies tribulaciones et angustiae, dies calamitatis et misere dies tenenberum et caliginis dies nebulae et turbina. It shall be this day of tribulation and anguish. It shall be a time of calamity and misery. It shall be a time of, of uh, darkness and turbulence. Uh, what we talked about in our first session was how Zephaniah was speaking, not only for his own time, the last days of Judah coming, the Babylonian captivity, but how it speaks for the last days. It keeps using phrases, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. This tells us and shows us that what happened in the last days of Judah is a foreshadowing of what happens in the last days before Jesus comes back or, or when Jesus comes back. And so we continue now in chapter 2. Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather, O nation, without shame. Before the decree takes effect, the day passes like the shaft. Before the burning anger of the Lord comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. What it's saying is this. Gather yourselves together, O nation, without shame. When things that were considered to be disgraceful, reprobate, become acceptable and mainstream, that is a society, a nation, and a civilization in trouble, and the judgment of God is looming. When there is no shame in having children out of wedlock, when there's no shame in homosexuality and lesbianism, when there is no shame in things that are morally reprobate, it's just socially acceptable conduct, that signals the anger and judgment of God. Now, of course, all the great civilizations of the world, Rome, Babylon, Assyria, they all went through this process. But so did Israel in the last days of Israel, the 10 northern tribes that we read about in Hosea and Amos and so forth, and also in the last days of Judah that Zephaniah is warning about. Again, the name Zephaniah comes from the Hebrew infinitive to hide, to hide. Then it continues. The Lord's anger is burning. Um, when people are so demonstrably devoid of any moral foundation in what they the Lord's anger begins to burn. In the United States this past week, the state of Massachusetts. Uh, now that was where the pilgrims came on the Mayflower and so forth, f fleeing King James and looking for religious freedom and things of this nature. It had a biblical foundation as a, as a state or known as a commonwealth. Now, it went wrong because of the Calvinists and the Salem witch trials and all of that stuff, but there was still some kind of a Judeo-Christian premise to its foundation. Last week, Massachusetts voted that a 16-year-old girl is allowed to have an abortion without parental consent. You're allowing legally underaged girls, 
legally underage, under the age of sexual consent, uh, that if somebody who's over that age has uh, sexual relations with her, they could be charged with statutory rape. But she has a right to an abortion, even a publicly funded abortion at the expense of the taxpayers, doesn't have to inform her parents. They have no say in it. And if they object, tough. This is the world we live in. This is what America has come to. This is what Britain has come to. Now let's begin to understand what happens. We are then told in verse 3, Seek the Lord, all you in humble of the earth, who have carried out his ordinances. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. God stops appealing to the societies and the nations at large. He appeals to those within those societies and nations who abide by his word who follow, who carry out his ordinances. They don't just give lip service and say, I believe this, I believe this, I believe this. They live by what they claim to believe. They live by what they claim to believe. Then it continues. There's a possibility of being hidden from the wrath to come. We are not appointed unto wrath. Tribulation, that's going to happen. It's always happened. Wrath, judgment of God, not. Remember, tribulation comes from Satan. Wrath comes from God. The wrath of God is worse than the tribulation of Satan. When we read the book of Revelation, much worse. Then it begins speaking of events in the Middle East, specifically to do with Israel at that particular time. For Gaza will be abandoned, and Ashkelon a desolation. Ashdod will be driven out at noon, and Ekron will be uprooted. Woe to the inhabitants of the seacoast, the nation of the Kirithites. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines, and I will destroy you. So there will be no inhabitant. So the seacoast will be pastures with caves for shepherds and folds for flocks. And the coast will be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They will pasture on it. And the houses of Ashkelon, they will be, uh, they will lie down at the evening. For the Lord their God will care for them and restore their fortune. Notice that before a restoration comes a destruction. Now, it's very conspicuous that these locations now, Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, south of the area south of Tel Aviv, in between Tel Aviv and, and uh, the uh, Sinai, along the coast where the Gaza Strip is, and the associated or the adjacent areas. This was the land, had been the land of the Philistines, strategically suppressed by David, but then it got out of control again. Then it got out of control again and presented a strategic threat to Judah that God let happen. Well, once again, you see this. Now, a replay in the modern age, Israel unilaterally withdrew from Gaza. It was forced to capture Gaza in self-defense in 1967. What the world does not tell you, but those who are in a position to know, know, such as the World Health Organization, that Gaza had been impoverished before 1967 to the point of astronomical infant mortality, very low longevity, that the standard of living and everything from employment to longevity to reduced infant mortality, it improved 370% under the Israelis. The Israelis withdrew. 
unilaterally under international pressure gave up Gaza. They were going to make a Palestinian state and the Palestinian Authority and Hamas had a civil war with each other, exterminated each other. Hamas comes out in control of Gaza while the Palestinian Authority retains control of the Muslim Arab communities of the West Bank. So now you don't have a two-state solution or a three-state. <laughs> You've got two rival Palestinian states in waiting the way it stands. And they're firing katushas. Where are they firing the katushas? Well, at Ashkelon. At, you know, Stirot, at, at that same, the, the same area. These same things that happened then are happening again now. And a massive destruction came to that area in the last days of Judah. Well, a massive destruction is going to come again. The Gaza Strip is going to be emaciated. There will be significant damage to the surrounding Israeli cities. Kiryat Gat, Ashkelon, and Ashdod will all be within target range. You've got a ton of people in Gaza controlled by demonized madmen, Hamas. Something eventually will happen again that will not just resemble, but to some degree replay what happened circa 585 BC. Well, let's continue to look. There will be a restoration of the fortune of Judah, but it will only be for certain people. Verse 8, I have heard the taunting of Moab and the revilings of the sons of Ammon with which they have taunted my people and become arrogant against their territory. Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab will be like Sodom and the sons of Ammon like Gomorrah, a place possessed by nettles and salt pits and a perpetual desolation. The remnant of my people will plunder them, and the remainder of my nation will inherit them. Now, understand the following. Moab, of course, is southern Jordan. Ammon is northern Jordan. I'm sorry, Moab is central Jordan. The very south of Jordan is Edom. Seven out of ten people, 70% of the population of Jordan are Palestinian Arabs. It is a Palestinian state. It was founded by the British as a Palestinian state after World War I, except that it had a Hashemite government. Hashemites being the tribe from Saudi Arabia. And it has a Bedouin minority, a Bedouin minority of about 30% of the population. But yes, Arafat made claims in 1970 that Jordan is Palestine. And the Jordanians admitted it. King Hussein of Jordan admitted it. There is a hostility that is endemic, it does not change be, between the inhabitants of Jordan and the inhabitants of Judah of, and Israel. Although the Arabians and the Gulf states, the Emirates, may seek peace with Israel because of a common fear of Iran and so forth, the Palestinians remain hostile and will continue to do so. The Palestinian Arabs, so-called, remain hostile. Now, this prophecy, where there's an obliteration that you don't know where anything was, like happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. When God destroys something the way he destroys Sodom and Gomorrah, 
it's obliterated to the point that there's no trace of where it even was. This has never historically happened. In the intertestamental Hasmonean period, this area did come under the strategic control of Israel. It was from here the Idumeans came, Edomites who converted to Judaism, Herod the Great being one of them. His parents were Idumeans, and they migrated west into the northern Negev. But the rest of this prophecy, it never happened. No such destruction has ever happened. It's like the prophecy of Isaiah 17. It still must happen because Damascus was never totally obliterated. So too, Amman Jordan was never totally obliterated. And Amman Jordan is a huge city. 75% of the population of Jordan as a nation lives in and around Amman, lives in and around Amman. This has never happened, but it must happen. Partial fulfillments in the history past, yes. When the Jews came back from Babylon, uh, in time they emerged after the Seleucid period and the Hasmoneans were somewhat a regional power and they did get strategic control of the east bank of the Dead Sea and so forth. But the prophecy in this kind of detail uh, of, of the sons of Ammon being like Gomorrah and so forth, this has never happened. A perpetual desolation, uh, we, we read in verse 9. No, it's never been a perpetual desolation. Jordan has never been a perpetual desolation. It's not happened, but it must happen. Okay. We continue. Verse 19. This they will have in return for their pride because they have taunted and become arrogant against the people of the Lord of hosts. Now look what it says. We are told, first of all, that they are the people of the Lord. They are the people of the Lord. Secondly, we are told that the land is the Lord's. The remainder of my nation will inherit them. Verse 18. Make no mistake about it. It does not depend on the infidelity or even the rejection of Yeshua by most Jews and by Israel. It only depends on God's patriarchal promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It only depends on what you read in Genesis 49. It only depends on what God promised the fathers. Romans 11 tells us this. They remain beloved for the sake of their fathers. Now, are they going to suffer a terrible, ugly history because of their rejection of the Messiah? Yes. Who would want a history like the Jews have had? Will Jews who reject their Messiah go to hell? Not only will they go to hell, but they'll be the first ones there, according to Romans. According to Romans, because the gospel was available to them first, the consequences for rejecting it are upon them first. Salvation is available to them first by virtue of covenant. Uh, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But there'll be tribulation for every man who rejects the Lord to the Jew first and also the Greek. Because the salvation, the blessing, is for the Jew first by virtue of patriarchal promise and covenant, so too are the ramifications of rejecting it. Nonetheless, despite that, despite it, 
It's not about them. It's about God's promise. It is still his nation. It is still his land. They are still his people. Now, we have some new people joining us. I'll explain this very quickly for the sake of those who may not be familiar. The rest of you may plug your ears for a very few minutes. Nearly all of the time, nearly all of the time, the New Testament, with very limited exception, makes a distinction between the people of God and the children of God. Israel and the Jews are the people of God. Born-again believers, Jew or non-Jew, are the children of God. In Great Britain, you have Prince Charles, a future king. Prince Charles, on his father's descent, his paternal pedigree is Greco English. It's 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 Grecian descent. His father's family were Greek, Anglo Greek. His mother was Hanoverian German, and her mother was from Scotland, a Celt from Scotland, the former Queen Mother. Prince Charles does not have a single drop of Welsh blood in his veins. Not a drop. He has no Welsh DNA whatsoever. No Welsh markers. He's not Welsh. Hanoverian German, Scottish, Celt, Greek, He's hardly an Englishman, but he's certainly not a Welshman. Yet he's the Prince of Wales. Why? He's not even one of the people of Wales. They forced him to learn Welsh as a kid because he was the Prince of Wales. They had him tutored to learn Welsh, but he had nothing Welsh about him. Most of his property is in the Duchy of Cornwall. He doesn't even have much in Wales. But he's the Prince of Wales. Why is he the Prince of Wales if he's not Welsh? Because he is the son. <laughs> Believers have their status not based on birth but based on second birth. Christians in any nation, China, Britain, Europe, the States, Latin America, Africa, Far East, it doesn't matter. They're the children of God. But they're not the people of God. The Jews are the people of God. A reprobate people? Yes. A people in rejection of their own Messiah? Yes. A people who have violated the Torah and the covenants? Yes. But they're still his people. He does not perpetually give them up. Lo me, they're not my people. It says in Hosea, but then he takes them back. They remain the people of God. The land remains his. When we get to Zechariah chapter 12 and the final showdown comes, we see whose side Jesus is on. He fights for his people after his children have been raptured. Now, it is possible to be a natural branch, like my wife, my kids. It is possible to be one of the people who are also one of the children. It is possible for one of the people to be a child. 
John 1, 12, he came to his own, the Jews, but his own did not believe. But in context, but whoever believed, he gave the right to become the children of God. Now, is that expanded, extended for all nations? Yes. But in its immediate exegetical context, it's talking about Jews. They were his own, his people, but they're not his children. You can be one of his people by birth, but you can only be one of his children by second birth. Okay, the rest of you can unplug your ears. I had to explain this. Well, let's continue looking at this. Verse 11. The Lord will be terrifying to them. He will starve all the gods of the earth and all the coastlands of the nations will bow down to him, everyone from his own place. Jesus is Lord. Allah will be debunked. Krishna, Rama, Sitra will be debunked. That imposter, the queen of heaven, pretending to be Mary, will be debunked. She's Diana of Ephesus. She's Artemis, but she's not Miriam. The gods of the earth will be debunked. One of the things you see in a rebellion is eclecticism. This merger of false religions coming together and the apostate church and Israel joining in. to this syncretism. They will be dethroned. Now remember, we're reading both for the time it was written and we are reading for the return of Christ. Also, there's elements for his first coming. You also, O Ethiopians, will be slain by my sword. For he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria. And he will make Nineveh a desolation parched like the wilderness. These things have historically happened. There have been mass destructions in Somalia, Ethiopia, going back to ancient times. What we call in Hebrew the land of Cush, the land of Cush. Black people are called Cushim or Cushites in Hebrew, Cushim. Okay. These things have happened. But notice these same nations come into play again. Assyria, Northern Iraq, Nineveh. Flocks will lie down in her midst, all beasts which range in herds, both the pelican and the hedgehog. These are not kosher animals. These are unclean animals. Now we have a teaching uh, on the bimbo in the basket or something like that from the book of Zechariah about the birds of the air, the difference between kosher birds and unkosher birds and birds that are terrestrial and birds that are not, that nest when they fly and how the, every unclean bird, how the unkosher birds are pictures of demons. Uh, the birds come and devour the seed and so forth of the gospel. Be that as it may, I refer you to that teaching. But let's look at this. These unclean birds are going to come. Okay. And they'll lodge at the tops of her pillars. Birds will sing in the windows Desolation will be on the threshold, for he has laid bare the cedar work. It's going to be a haunt of demons. The cedar work. Uh, 
like the cedars of Lebanon, Arizim, most of the temple, the construction, was covered cedar. King Hiram floated it down to Jaffa, and then it was taken overland by David to Jerusalem. Most of the temple was built with it. These are the cedars of Lebanon. Now we have a teaching called temple typology where we deal with this. Uh, how the church is the temple seven times according to the New Testament. It is the naos, it is the oikos hegios, it is the uh, heron and so forth. But most of the temple were seated to Lebanon. Most of the church is made up of Gentile Christians. You understand? They, they're not native from Israel, where the gospel is from and where Jesus is from. They're from the Gentile nations. Most of what went into the temple's construction was from the Gentile nations. The Jews had the blueprint but from God, but the materials and the labor, the building of it, were Gentile. Uh, we nobody could cut cedars like the Phoenicians were told, and that's repeated in Scripture. Now, again, I only mention this in passing. You can listen to the older recording on temple typology. Be that as it may, it's going to be exposed. The dry rot and the wet rot in the church is going to be exposed in the cedars. The apostasy will be exposed. The demonized nature of it. I watched the video clip two weeks ago. It was astounding of Protestant clergymen promoting homosexuality as a Christian cause, including an Anglican bishop. Believing they were doing the right thing. Well, the birds are singing in the window. The demons are in Lambeth Palace and in Canterbury Cathedral and in St. Paul's and in Lincoln Cathedral and in Liverpool Cathedral. The birds are singing in the window. It continues. This is the exultant city which dwells securely, who says in her heart, I am and there's no one beside me. How she has become a desolation, a resting place for beasts. Everyone who passes by her will hiss and wave his hand in contempt. Do you see what she says? It's in the females personified. I am and there's no one other than me. Look with me, please, to the book of Revelation. We read in chapter 18, verse 3, about the immorality and the uh, rapprochement or the connection between the kings of the earth, the political powers, and the immorality of this false religion, who commit acts of immorality with her. And then the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. Goes on, come out of her, my people. Now look what she says, what she, the way she thinks of herself. She says in verse 7, I sit as a queen, I'm not a widow, I'll never see. Mourning. Oblivious to the fact that it's the Lord who judges her and he is strong in uh, the following verse 8. She thinks she's invisible. Now notice, it's the kings, the merchants, and the false religion, the harlot, of which 
apostate Christendom will be central. You will have commerce, industry, economy. You will have government and you will have false religion, a tripod. It can only, a tripod can only stand if it has three legs. If there's only two, it won't stand. These people in the corporate monopolies, these people in governments, they may outwardly profess to be agnostic. They, they don't believe or they don't live according to what they say, but they will still be religious. Joe Biden, he is radically pro-abortion. He's radically in favor of the murder of babies. Yet he attends the Roman Catholic Church faithfully and they will not excommunicate him. They need it. Monopolies in the new economy, things like uh, Google and, uh, and, and Facebook and increasingly Amazon, they need government to eliminate competition and to put them in a privileged position. Government needs them. They'll just censor anything that the political establishment doesn't want to hear. This is what you wind up with. The merchants, the harlot, and the kings. It is no coincidence that right now, and again, I only mention this briefly. Right now, when they're talking about things like the Great Reset, with the advent of artificial intelligence and so forth, and going to a digital currency and things like this. This week, that guy in Europe, uh, Schwab, Schwab's a European. He's not American. Notice he comes from Europe, from Germany. The founder of the Davos Forum, World Economic Forum. It's coming from Europe, as Daniel said. Asia, America may be involved, but Schwab, I'm not saying he is the Antichrist, but he's certainly an Antichrist, and he's of that spirit. He openly says that COVID-19 should be used to advance the Great Reset. He openly says it. Bill Gates has said it, not with his words, so much, only hinted at it, but he certainly said it with his actions. Okay. Now you've got Pope Francis playing the same card. You're going to have false religion. You're going to have a corrupt, monopolistic corporate business establishment and godless politicians. You're going to have the tripod that Revelation 17 says will be there. Religion is indispensable to this. Now, unfortunately, the apostate church, and by apostate church, I don't mean the, the obvious apostate church, like Rome or liberal Protestants or the World Council of Churches. That's a given. I mean apostate evangelicism will be a player on this team. There's too much money and power involved. Remember the false religions 
at the end of the age are like liberal Protestantism, but not only them, holding the form of religion, but denying the power therein. They have no spiritual power. They have no spiritual power other than of a demonic nature. But the World Council of Churches, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church, now the Southern Baptists, they have no spiritual power, none. Greer, the president of the Southern Baptists, once the Baptists says evangelicals should be the most outspoken proponents of homosexual and lesbian <laughs> rights. <laughs> These are Baptists claiming to be born again. Those birds are chirping through the window of the Baptist church. And you see, not many are standing up and speaking out. The Lord is not talking to them anymore. He only speaks to the humble of the land who abide by his ordinances, who say non-therapeutic abortion is wrong, who say homosexuality is wrong, who say divorce and remarriage for arbitrary reasons unless the unbeliever leaves is wrong, who say these things are wrong, these things which will saturate someone with shame when they stand before the Lord are not seen as shameful. They're not seen as any kind of a moral indictment, except among the so-called humble. Who follow his ordinances. This goes on. Well, what do we see next? Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled, the tyrannical city. We'll pick up from there next week, but let's look at the present situation. Some years ago, I did a conference in England with Dave Hunt. He was my dear friend and brother, now with the Lord. Look forward to seeing him again. And uh, we did a conference together, me, him, I think it was Chuck Missler or somebody. And he was also with the Lord. Now, anyway, the Lord gave me a message which I delivered called The Death of Reason. And in The Death of Reason, I pointed out that the scripture tells us we have the power of sound mind and that our faith is reasonable. It's not reasonable to be a Hindu. It's not reasonable to drink contaminated water from the Ganges and die of cholera and think it's holy. It's not reasonable. It's not reasonable to be a Muslim. What did the, the, how can Miriam, the sister of Moses and Miriam, the mother of Jesus, be the same woman when they lived at least 13 centuries apart? How can you believe a religion? When you read the Hadith, they were drinking cow urine. How can you believe? It's just not reasonable. Not reasonable. Our faith is not intellectual, but it's intellectually defensible. It's reasonable. We are called to have the power of sound mind. The power of sound mind. Not to be crazy. Now, of course, Satan got in through people like Michael Brown and John Arnott and Wynne Lewis and with the Toronto and Pensacola and the counterfeit revivals and people were acting out of their mind. They were acting 
virtually foaming at the mouth, rolling on the floor. <laughs> they, they were not behaving reasonably. The fruit of the Spirit is always a crete, self-controlled. We're told twice in the New Testament, a crete. When you see people out of control, that means the Holy Spirit is not in control of them. If the Holy Spirit is in control of somebody, they'll be in control of themselves. This lack of, this forfeiture of reason. You see it in, in uh, the mass demonization with radical Islamic rallies. Just go to a funeral of a terrorist in the Gaza Strip. You'll see this mass demonization. It's similar to what the Germans did with Hitler. Or you see, see this with Kundalini Yoga in India. Well, you see this among lunatic fringe evangelicals who listen to people like Michael Brown and so forth. And, and John Arnott and these people. And Randy Clark and all that, that laughing drunken stuff. Nicky Gumbel and these things. Our faith is reasonable, and we have the power of sound mind, because the world is crazy. The scripture juxtaposes those who are in Christ with the world, and it says the world is crazy. We're not supposed to be crazy. We have the mind of Christ. We're not supposed to be crazy. In the eyes of the world, we may be fools for Christ, but we're not crazy. Well, the death of reason. When you say to someone, and I pointed this out, you can go to the message of the death of reason. So, you believe in evolution. Yes. Okay. And you believe in science. Yes. So, if you go to Oxford University or to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology or to California Caltech or Stanford or one of these very top universities in the world or Princeton University or Cambridge University and you go to the faculty of information science, and the professors there will tell you, although there are software programs that can write other software programs, someone had to write the master program. In other words, information science, computer science, says that information cannot come from a vacuum. It requires a pre-existing intelligence. Organized information data, particularly encrypted data, cannot come from a vacuum. The human genome alone has 13 billion lines of information if you were to digitalize it, and it has been digitalized. 13 billion! A really sophisticated computer would have like 100,000. The human genome, just the human genome, 13 billion. How can this come from a vacuum? So in information science, they say it can't come from a vacuum. But you cross the campus and you go to the faculty of biomedical sciences and they'll tell you it can. How do you reconcile this? How can you get genetic coding when it is encrypted, digitalized information? You have nucleotide sequencing and DNA and so forth. How, how, how can you get encrypted, organized information of that complexity, particularly out of a vacuum when information science says you cannot? There was no information science when Darwin was around. They can't answer that question. They go into cognitive dissonance. They try to believe two mutually exclusive things at the same time. So you believe in what you call gay rights. 
Yes. And you're a Darwinist. Yes. And you think those people were born that way. Yes. Do you have any genetic proof? No. But you believe it. Yes. Well, if you're a Darwinist and you believe those people were born that way, they are genetically inferior. You must believe homosexuals and lesbians to be genetically inferior if you're a Darwinist because they cannot reproduce. It's survival of the fittest. Do you believe in saving the whales and protecting endangered species? Oh, yes. Why? They're not supposed to survive if you're a Darwinist. And it's some of them, Jonas Salk, who discovered poliomyosin, he admitted this contradiction on television in America. Unbelievable. Cognitive dissonance. You show a Jehovah's Witness. Look, Jehovah says in Deuteronomy, and there's copies of the Watchtower that admit it, that people who predict things in the name of Jehovah that don't happen are false prophets. Yes, it says that. Well, here's Charles Tazzy Russell. Here's Rutherford. Here's Nathan Noor. Here's your own leaders doing it. Jesus will be back in 1914. He'll be back in 1915. He'll be back in 1927. He'll be back in 1975. Out the door. Cognitive dissonance. It's illogical. It's irrational. There's no power of sound mind. When people believe things that are false, they lose the power of sound mind. It doesn't matter how intelligent they are, how educated they are. It only matters what they believe. They lose the power of sound mind. Now that in itself is an indictment of these counterfeit revivals of Pensacola and Toronto that went on 20 years ago and people like Michael Brown, it's an indictment of them. It's an indictment. The very fact that they, they do this stuff, it, they don't have the power of sound mind. It proves it's not God. No, it goes on. Can't you see what's happening? I asked black people in America, why is it that you reject black people who warn you against liberal politicians? I mean, Malcolm X said the worst thing that could happen to black people are white liberals. Ah. <laughs> uh, you respect Malcolm X? Yes. Well, this is what he said. Why, why, why are you going to say to them, oh, look, you know, my family, Irish, Jewish, you'll get a Jew who's a liberal, a Jew who's a conservative, a Democrat, Republican, Labor Party, Libertarian, Independent, Green Party, whatever. But you're not going to find the Jew in the Nazi party. Irish people, they may be Finians, they may be Sinn Féin, they may be, you know, any party, SDLP or whatever, but they're not going to vote unionist. Uh, you're not going to find an Armenian person who's going to vote for an Islamic Turkish nationalist, someone like Erdogan, <laughs> because of what was done to them. Because of the potato famine and things like that, the Irish are not going to... The Jews are not going to cause the Holocaust. Why would a black person vote for the party of Jim Crow and of, of slavery? No white person would do that. Can you answer... Why, why you vote for the party who did? 
It's not reasonable, is it? Well, you think it's different now? <laughs> it's been 50 years since civil rights. Where are most abortion clinics located? In and around Afro-American communities in the States. They need enough blacks to get themselves reelected like they did before the Civil War. You could vote three-fifths, 60% of your slaves for the candidate of your choice. That's how the Southern plantation owners kept political power. They told the blacks how to vote. You just want enough to keep power and to keep an underclass. But not too many. What are you doing now? They see the abortion in the black community as a way to reduce future prison populations and future welfare roles. They call the Afro-American population by killing black babies in their mother's womb. They just elected a senator standing in the pulpit of Martin Luther King's church who is one of the most radically pro-abortion figures in the United States. They vote for their own death. They vote for the death of their own children. How can you justify them? They lost their mind. There's no reason. They become crazy. And when you try to tell such people such things and say the reason these terrible things are happening to society is because you're turning away from the ordinances of God. That's why you have Darwinism. That's why you have these things. Social injustice, that's why you have these things. They tell you you're crazy. Again, it's not to do with aptitude or education. It's not to do with that. It's to do with sin and willful rebellion. It makes people stupid. And it doesn't matter how uneducated you are. The gospel makes people smarter. <laughs> it's not about natural intelligence or education. That's another thing. We have a teaching dealing with that called the real gospel of health and wealth. But it's not about that. Anybody who walks with Jesus is going to be smart. He knows everything and he's going to tell you what you need to know. Anybody who doesn't walk with Jesus is going to be stupid. Ultimately self-destructive. And that's what's happening. The tripod is being set up. Notice, just, again, just like it says in Daniel, it's coming from Europe. The Great Reset. Well, the first cousin, the natural bedfellow of the Great Reset, is obviously going to be the ecumenical movement and the interfaith movement. They're made for each other. And the kings of the earth, not the king, the kings of the earth. They must destroy nationalism in any sense that it can't be controlled by the tripod interest. Now, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I am not. I am simply looking at what is happening in light of prophecy. I'm not an alarmist, but I see it. The merchants, the kings of the earth, and false religion. And that false religion includes apostate evangelicism. But God is appealing. 
He's appealing to those who follow his word. He's not talking to these people anymore. They've gone too far. They've done what Judah did in the days of King Manasseh. They went too far with killing the kids. They've aborted too many babies. He's not even dealing with them. Remember when God told Jeremiah, don't even pray for these people anymore? Don't even pray for them? In Romans 1, we are told three times that people who push the homosexual and lesbian agenda and enter into that. It says three times, God gives them over. They're given over. Don't even pray for them. You look at that homosexual newscaster in America, Don Lemon, who hates Christian values and things. Just look at him. <laughs> He's given over. Now these people get the upper hand. They do get the upper hand. We see this in the book of Revelation. In temporal terms, they seem to get the upper hand. The people of God must be hidden, rescued, evacuated, and they're persecuted. They get the upper hand. Why do the wicked prosper? This is in Jeremiah. It's in Psalm 73. Why do the wicked prosper? They're prospering in the church. They're in control of the denominations. The wicked are in control of the denominations. Assemblies of God, the Baptists, the Anglicans... This pro-abortion senator is a Methodist clergyman. I think he's a Methodist. But he's in a Baptist church. It doesn't matter. They're in control. The wicked prosper. You look at these godless people. They will not censor pornography or anything like that. They will censor political opinion. Or moral opinion that Dorsey and Zuckerberg and Google, that, that, that Polish American woman, that, the wicked prosper. Politically, George Bush is looking forward, he says, to the inauguration of Biden. Well, they're two of a kind. Okay. The wicked prosper. Oh, Obama and Clinton and the, the Feinstein and the Schumer and the, the, this new guy Warnock. Why do the wicked prosper? <laughs> because they are being set up. Very frustrating to see the wicked prosper. It's very frustrating to see the godly suppressed, even persecuted. But then I perceived their end. I perceived their end. I don't know if there can be another period of respite I don't know if there can be another revival before the Lord comes, but if there is, it can't happen in this present state the church is in. It'll have to come from outside of it. The way the hippies, the Jesus movement was outside the mainstream denominations, and it'd have to be something like that. Denominational Christianity is too far gone. Even ones that used to be good are not what they were, like Calvary chapels and things. You can't go with any of these things anymore. And people like John MacArthur have lost their mind. You can take the mark of the beast and all this stuff and still be saved. And even he's lost his mind. They're crazy. No.
It's nothing to do now. The question is, what is God saying to those who keep his ordinances? To those who want to live scripturally? It's going to get so sick with, if this reset happens with the advent of AI. You mark my word. I, I warned about this 25, 30 years ago. I said virtual technology is going to be come so advanced, people will artificially construct their own delusional reality and think they're Napoleon or Cinderella and escape into the cyber world. And that will be their reality. It won't matter what happens in the outside world. I remember witnessing to an unsaved guy smoke cigars and think, and I just try to tell him, he would just say, no, I don't believe in it. I don't believe in it. I he thought that by saying he didn't believe in something, that dismissed any possibility of the reality of it. <laughs> Just because he said, I don't believe it, I don't believe it. That meant it didn't exist to him. When he gives up the ghost, he finds out it does exist. And it's too late. We did a teaching some time ago, about a year ago, on the narrative. And how people follow the narrative. It's like when the Soviet Union was collapsing, the narrative was Marxism, which is based on a Darwinistic Hegelian model that says as capitalism evolved from feudalism, so communism will come from capitalism. Therefore, England should have been the first communist country because it was the first capitalist one but instead it happens in Russia, the last feudal country. <laughs> Direct contradiction to what Marxism was based on, philosophically. Again, that was Darwinistic. Darwinism and, he and Hegel's philosophy. You, you say, Look, it, it didn't happen what Marx said. It didn't evolve the way he said. It happened in Russia, a feudal country. It didn't happen in Britain, a capitalist country. That doesn't fit the narrative. <laughs> You tell people, look, how can you believe the Roman Catholic Church is the one true church? Look at the pedophilia and the cover-up. Now the Pope is going, saying homosexuality is all right. They'll still believe it. Maybe in a cognitively dissonant way, but they'll believe it. It doesn't matter. But with AI... It's going to get worse. One of the main components, one of the things fueling the drive for the so-called reset is artificial intelligence. Forget about things like internet pornography. In artificial intelligence, you'll be able to act out that fantasy in a cyber world. It's going to involve robotics. It's going to... <laughs> people, they're going to replace sex with cyber sex and robotics. Mark my words, it will happen. You want to date with Marilyn Monroe? No problem. Give us your credit card number. We'll have her at your place in two minutes, two seconds. It's going to get like that. People will enter an artificial cyber world that will become their functional reality, except it's not real. And when that happens, they'll believe anything. They'll do anything. You look... I can't get out. All the restaurants are closed. The theaters are closed. I can't go to a ball game. I'm just stuck in the house all the time because of the lockdown. So people, where are they going? They're going online. 
We can't go to church anymore. Well, we'll have church on Zoom, the electronic church. And eventually, when you say in a sermon homosexuality is wrong, Google will close you down for hate speech. It violates their policy. They'll have a radical Muslim on there, but not you. This is what it's coming to. The problem is there is no telling these people anymore. God is not interested in telling them. He is only appealing to those who carry out his ordinances. Perhaps you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. God is getting angrier and angrier and angrier. When his wrath explodes, it'll be beyond human comprehension. It's coming. That whore is going to die in Revelation 17. Those kings of the earth, the merchants of the earth, We know these things are setting the stage for the Antichrist and false prophet, aren't they? They're going to follow him. Ultimately. But by the grace of God, those who keep his word won't. We will be hidden. We have to use common sense. Jesus said when they persecute you in this city, flee to the next. We have to use common sense. Faith and common sense are not mutually exclusive. Pray before you take an aspirin, but don't think God can't use medical science. Faith and common sense are not mutually exclusive. On the contrary, we have the power of sound mind. Our faith is reasonable. Once again, uh, use common sense. But in times of tribulation and persecution, it's not the wrath of man we have to be afraid of. It's the wrath of God that's coming against them. And when they mess with Israel, and when they persecute the true church, God takes it very, very personally. What would you do if somebody abused your child? Look at history. What, what's happened to every nation that ever persecuted the Jews? Look what happened to them. And it happened quickly. You build the wall around the Warsaw Ghetto, any Jew climb over the wall gets machine gunned. Within a few years, a wall is built around Berlin, any German climbing over the wall gets machine gunned. I've seen it. Spain was the world power until the Inquisition. Then Francis Drake sunk the Armada and Britannia ruled the waves. Then Britain revoked the Bellflower Declaration. Let the Jews burn instead of going home to the land they promised them. So Coventry and London and Liverpool burned and Britannia no longer ruled the waves. It's always been like that throughout history. Anybody who messed with them, God has taken it personally. Who will be hidden? Now, don't worry. God has a controversy with his people, but they're his people. <laughs> Takes his things personally. No, friends. 
don't worry about man. Use common sense, be led by the Holy Spirit, but don't worry about the wrath of man. It's the wrath of God that's coming. And it's going to be infinitely more ferocious and eternal. We can be hidden. Let us, in his grace, keep his ordinances. Keep his word. Now, I know... Tribulaciones et angustiae, dies calamititas et miserae dies tenebarum et calignos dies nebulae et turbinis. That's all true. But it's also true that Jesus said, when you see these things happening, lift up your head. Your redemption draws near. We'll continue next week with part three, chapter three of the book of Zephaniah. Thank you for listening. If there's any questions, I'll take them, but they must, must be directly related to what was stated tonight. Jacob, thank you for that. And we do look forward to part three next week. That's the 13th of January, Wednesday, the 13th of January. 7 o'clock here UK time on RTN TV. For those of you who have joined us throughout the programme, thank you for joining us. Um, if you have missed any particular parts of the programme, it has been recorded and will go up on RTN TV uh, tomorrow. So if you want to either catch up on something to clarify what Jacob said, or if you missed a certain segment, the recording will be on RTN TV tomorrow. Jacob, you said something at the beginning of the lesson I just want to clarify or, or get you to expand, really, and develop the thought which you, you, you portrayed. You said, and I'll quote your words verbatim, there will be a partial hiding from the wrath to come. Are you looking at something in the same as the children of Israel when the doorposts were covered by the blood of the Lamb, that the wrath of God passed them by? It was all around them. Absolutely. They escape it, but that they passed the, them by. That is an exact reference to it, Yes. Why do you think that? What, what, what's the, the point of time okay. draw from that? If you don't know, well, I'm not saying you don't know. The judgments on Egypt still commemorated in the Paschal Seder. Hoshek, darkness, dam, blood, frog, svardaya. You still fill up a saucer with drops of wine that yeah. correspond to the cup of God's wrath and revelation. Pharaoh's magicians, of course, counterfeited the miracles of Moses and Aaron the way the Antichrist and false prophet are going to counterfeit the miracles of Jesus and his witnesses. Those judgments on Egypt are a foreshadow and a microcosm of God's coming judgment on the world. When they left Egypt, they brought Joseph's bones with them. The dead in Christ rise first, we come out together. The entire Exodus story is a prophetic foreshadowing of the rapture and resurrection and the events leading up to it. They are replayed, they happen again, and you're exactly right. The, the people of God were protected by the blood of the Lamb, and so it will be now. <laughs> it will be protected by the blood of the Lamb. So will that be for the household when the Lord tells us you and your household will be saved, or is it looking at individuals who follow the Lord? It always comes down to individuals, but God is in the business of saving families. Think of the story of Noah. He wanted to save the family. Think of the story of Lot. He wanted to save the family. Now, some of Lot's family were not saved. Jesus said, parents will turn against children, children against parents. Do you love God more than you love anything else. Yeah. This is going to be it. Thank you, Jacob. Really interesting. Okay, folks, anyone got any questions on tonight's subject? I'd appreciate you unmuting your microphone and presenting Jacob with your question. This is uh, Terry, can I ask? Hi, Terry, good evening. Thank you. 
Jacob, I really do appreciate the message. And I want to come back to one of the things you were commenting on is what is God saying to believers? Given that uh, with, with the mark of the beast, that um, in that time, we won't, it'll be difficult to buy and sell. Should you think one of the things God is telling us now is be a, a prepper? That is storing up food and water and things and, of that. And exercise common sense, but survivalism and things like that. The safe place is not hiding in the mountains in Montana or the Canadian Rockies. The safe place, the only safe place, will be in the hand of God. Okay. Now, Got exercising it. common sense, that's fine. But realize that security is not in anything other than being in God's will. Great. Thank you. So I wanted to ask that question. I know certainly in the States, it really is quite a big thing where people, they dig, you know, um, underground bunkers in the garden. They store tins of beans and they've got water recycling plants and that whole thing with guns and all the rest of it. Is that something that in your area is quite prevalent or just something you're toying with? You're asking me? No, Terry. Yeah. No, it's, it's something that gets talked about a lot in conservative circles. Uh, I think it's, it's a little over the top because they think they're actually going to survive because of the prepping. Um, right. I'm more inclined, like, well, as Jacob articulated, trust in the spirit to tell you what to do, but use common sense with this. Yeah. Yeah, but buying guns and such doesn't seem to make much sense to me um, when I'm trusting in the Lord. Thank you, Terry. That's good. Thank you. Anyone else got a question for Jacob? I do. Hi. I'm Joanne. Hi, Joanne. From the States. Um, I was just wondering what he thought of the COVID shots. The COVID shot? Yeah. The vaccine. Well, I can only speak about it relative to tonight's subject. I think that COVID-19 is China's gift to the world, but it is being politically exploited and manipulated for political purposes. You have the politicization of science. So we're not just looking at scientific and medical issues. It is as much or more a political issue, and it's being used for purposes of manipulation. It is not, however, the mark of the beast, as some people say. It is not the mark of the beast. However, mandatory vaccinations and things of that nature do show that the world is evolving in that direction. It's helping to set the stage for it, but it's All not. Right. All right. Okay, thank you. For, thank you for the question. Anyone else got a question on tonight's topic? Yes, I, I have, have a question. question. I hear a lady's voice, but who was the lady? I must be muted. Oh, hi, Beryl. Sorry, hi. Hi. Uh, I must be muted. because no, no, I, I can, keep... can hear you. We can hear you. Can you hear me? Right, okay. Jacob, um, in chapter 2 of Zephaniah, when mm -hmm. we got to verse 9, um, you talk about um, Ammon and Moab, which is uh, Jordan. Yes. And we know that that was greater Israel. It's part of greater Israel. Yeah. Well, two times. David conquered. Well, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. Historically, David conquered part of it. But in the Hasmonean period, part of it was incorporated. However, in the millennial reign, it'll be in greater Israel. Yes. Yeah. So, therefore, if you go to Zechariah 13 and verse 8... It says about the when the Lord comes, He's going to um, just obliterate two thirds. Is that two thirds of Greater Israel or two thirds of Israel now? Because when He comes, surely He's going to take the land that they uh, were given to Abraham anyway. Okay, there is there is a school of opinion that says that when the Antichrist makes his treaty, and particularly after the church is removed, that all Jews are going to be there. <laughs> there is that view. I'm not saying it's absolutely certain. I'm just saying there are people who hold that view. 
but I can say for sure that the majority of the world's Jews are going to be in Israel at that time. Already, already, Israel has rivaled the United States as having the most Jews. Israel's population, a Jewish population, mm. is as big as that in the United States. And that's only if you take non-practicing Jews, intermarried Jews, everything, you know. <laughs> it's only if you include every Jew in America, you know, like the half Jewish or whatever. It's only if you were non-practicing, they don't believe it. There's a lot of Jews like that in the States. Even if you include them, Israel has as many as the states now. Um, it will overtake the United States as the main Jewish population center, given present trends. Particularly, where are they going to where are they going to fit them all in if they yep. keep coming? There's hey, another listen. million and a half the Jewish agencies say are coming in 2021. If you look at what's happening in France with the anti-Semitism and how many Jews are leaving because of the Muslims and so forth. Yeah. Um, where are they going to put them in? Well, if you've ever been to Hong Kong, you know. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, high rise, yeah. It looks awful. If you've ever been hey, to well. Hong Kong, you'd be amazed. Yeah, it's an interesting question that Beryl has raised there. If you look at places like Williamsburg in, in the New York area, those places are effectively a microcosm of Israel. They're established and they're organized and they're run like a, a Jewish state within the United States of America. What would drive them to go back to Israel, the land of the forefathers? We know what's happened the, the, in the, France. Already de Blasio, de Blasio and uh, the mayor of New York City and Cuomo have prevented them from having funerals and things yes. of that nature. Yes. You know, they, they're obligated. To, in, in their culture, which is religion, it's all based on religion, on mitzvot, Having marriages and having bar mitzvahs and having halabayas like funerals and memorials, these things you can't practice your faith without doing it. You understand? Mm -hmm. If that's threatened to them, they'll they'll go to B'nai Brak and they'll go to Mayor Sharim. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll do that. So it wouldn't have to be oppression or persecution like you'd have in France or Europe to that extreme. It could simply be a closure and a restriction of, of their lifestyle that have become so accustomed. Of the ultra-Orthodox, yes, absolutely. Okay. But remember now in Israel, the, the highest rate of COVID infection is among them. It's among them. You yeah, know, these that. people, if you don't know what they are, they're like the Amish, the Pennsylvania Dutch. They literally live in a different century. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's, and it's super legalistic. And Thank you. Like the German. Thank you. Uh, James, I have a question. Yes. Oh, Eric, my apologies. You, you popped up in the minute. The problem is we have a bit of delay, a bit of bit of lag. If I can just go to Christian, because he was the first one up after Beryl, then we'll go to uh, Eric, then Leah after that. Thank Christian. you so much. Jacob, thank you so much for your message tonight. Uh, regarding to false religion and uh, Zechariah 2, verse 14, Yes. Whereas uh, talking about the uh, unclean birds, would you agree that Jesus was saying something similar about the mustard seed in Matthew 13? Yeah, yeah. 32? On the tape that we have teaching that, it's on there. It's on the recorded teaching. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Eric Fernandez, good evening. So, Eric, you've got a question? Yes, sir. Um, uh, thank you, Jacob, once again for uh, today's teaching. It was really informative. And well, I gotta tell you, I'm glad you're Hispanic because you look like a radical. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. I I'm a missionary in Pakistan, so I'm trying Why to. Are you? God bless you. <laughs> Speak Hopefully, you know what? No, no, no. I'm, I'm far from that, but. It we have some from? contact. From the or I'm from uh, I'm from the Northeast. I grew up in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. But I live All in right. Oak Ridge, New Jersey now. <laughs> oh, oh, Pearsall Road, Hilliard Road, Calvary uh, Chapel, yeah. Lord Police Church. Yeah. I yeah. used to speak there. Yeah, I'm in Oak Ridge, New Jersey. Yes, sir. So I know in the in the New Testament, I know I've I've talked to a lot of evangelical uh, ministers, charismatic ministers that are balanced. 
they're not so far out there, but they do talk about a last day's revival a lot. Um, and, and a lot of even some of the guys I still teach and, and, and we, we discuss these things, they still talk about a last day's revival. But what I'm reading in the scripture in the New Testament particularly is that the last day does the last days does not talk about the re, a revival. It actually talks about an apostasy of right. falling away from the faith, a larger group of people actually believing false, uh, being deceived, believing falsehoods than a, a, a revival. Um, and I'm trying to trying to balance that in my own mind because I'm reading one thing, but I hear ministers say, hey, there's going to be a last day revival and then we're going to basically be raptured. But I don't I don't really see that. In the New Testament. First of all, you're absolutely correct that the scriptures speak more, considerably more, about an end times falling away than it does an end time revival. Secondly, what it does say about an end time revival, in like in the book of Joel, is focused on Israel. It's focused on the Jews. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so okay, thank you, Eric. Yeah, now, it's more complicated than that because it says on all flesh, but I can't go into it now. But essentially, I agree with you. All right. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. God bless. Hello, God bless. Jacob. Hello, Jacob. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I have a question regarding... Uh, Where are you from, please? Uh, I'm in Fort Worth, Texas, but I'm from Montreal, Canada. Oh. I actually met you in England uh, five years ago, twice. And uh, I used to live in England, in Bristol. And uh, I, your I, parents with us, and your father's a gendarme. Yeah, oui, mon père, mon père est dans la gendarmerie, ouais. Which you can play at vous et biologique, n'est-ce pas? Oui, c'est ça, c'est moi, oui, ouais. Bon. But I'm, I'm in Fort Worth now. My husband is American. We got married a year ago, so. Okay. I like nice. Fort Worth. Yeah, it's a nice place. Yeah, I really. I agree. like I like San Antonio too. Yeah, that's that's a like more south. Oh, <laughs> But yeah, my question is regarding uh, chapter two, and I underline it when you said sh the shameful nation. Yes. Um, like we know today is uh, January 6th, so Congress is about to certify the vote for yeah. um, whether Joe Biden is going to be president or not. And uh, as a Christian, and Terry kind of mentioned it, like it, it is true that among conservative circles, there is like a big, there's a lot of talk about prepping and what are we supposed to do. And it is like, in terms of, because, I don't know if we're going to be raptured tomorrow or not, but in terms of practicality, like what are we supposed to do if Biden gets in? This is, it's, it's clear. It's very bad, you know, for Christians and so on. So I'm just one, I'd like to have your perspective in terms of like practically, what are we supposed to do in the meantime until we get raptured? <laughs> Maybe that uh, was a question. <laughs> Après moi, le déluge. Après M. Trump, le déluge. Comprenez-vous? Le président du Canada est Pierre Trudeau, diabolique. Yeah, yeah. So, it's not just the States, you know, it's 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 Canada. It's it's all of it. I A dog is barking. It's probably Google sent them to drown me out. Um, <laughs> Uh, what do we do? Live by the Spirit. Make the most of the freedom we have. Continue to practice our faith as we always can. But understand, the left has an agenda to close down Christian freedom. Yeah. The United States is the last bastion. Uh, and it's going. Uh, remember, the... Freedom, the democratic freedom you had in English-speaking nations came from the influences of Scripture with both the British parliamentarians in the time of Cromwell, even though he made a lot of mistakes, to the foundations of the United States. Um, there was always a biblical influence. With that being eroded as a basis of democracy, democracy is being eroded, okay? Okay. For instance, uh, as you reap, you shall sow, okay? What you reap, you will sow, okay? Um, personal responsibility. You are not responsible for the ramifications of another person's actions or decisions. You're only responsible for your own. 
when they bring in the socialist agenda, you will be responsible <laughs> to pick up the bill for the stupidity of other people. You know what I'm saying? Uh, in the United States, three out of four black children are born out of wedlock. Automatically, they're statistically predisposed to dropping out of high school and to winding up in the criminal justice system. Yeah. Three out of four are, are born out of wedlock. It is much easier to say this is the fault of white people <laughs> instead of taking a personal moral responsibility, except that the government has created a welfare state where they have replaced the black husband and father with a welfare check. You understand? It's, it, it's all driven by an agenda. Yeah, you know, yeah, there is there, there is institutional racism in America, but it's the people you vote for. <laughs> They've lost their mind. Trudeau's the same. His father was a nut and his mother Margaret was a wacko. I shouldn't be saying this. It's the same in Canada. Uh, I was in Vancouver when Levesque, the, the French nationalist in, in Quebec, yeah. got elected that first time. And I remember how people freaked out. But the guy was saying things that, that didn't even make any sense. <laughs> it would have been an economic disaster for Quebec. And industries began moving and businesses out of Montreal to Toronto, a mass exodus, and going to the Western provinces. But there was <laughs> then they wanted to be subsidized. <laughs> to compensate for their own actions. One of the things that happens when democracy disappears is you are no longer simply responsible for the consequences of your own actions. You're expected to pick up the tab for other people's decisions. And that's what's happening. Yep. It's certainly happening in Canada and it's happening in the United States. Comprenez-vous? Oui, merci beaucoup. Merci pour votre Qu'est-ce que j'ai pour vous aujourd'hui? I think it's an important thing, Jacob, that uh, as believers uh, and those that have always had a, an evangelical heart where we try to reach out to people to witness and to give yeah. a reason for the season, etc. Yeah. The world today has closed that down. And the reality of the situation yeah. is that what should be quickening our hearts and our attitude is to go out and witness why we still can. But because we can yeah. only do this with Zoom, yeah. we can't go out of our doors. The devil has planned a masterful strategy. He's a chess player. And he's, he's, he's limited in his options. The Lord has won. We know that. That's the, the, the final play. Mm -hmm. However, the reality is, for everyone in the church, whatever opportunity we get, whatever opportunity is presented before us, we should be trying to witness, to convince people, to show yes. people the reality of the world and what the Bible has said is going to happen. Yes, yes we need to defend ourselves. We need to be practical, use common sense. To make sure maybe you need a big guard dog to keep people from robbing. There's all those sorts of things, if necessary, depending on you live. But the reality of it is it should be quickening our hearts and our minds to win as many souls as we can while we still have the light. And that's yes. such as you use all the time, Jacob, while we still have the light. While we still have the light. Yeah, absolutely. Leia, can I just go back to Leia for a second? Yeah. French Canadian girl. Um, is your father still in Ottawa? He was working in Ottawa last I heard. Ottawa, but they're all in lockdown right now. So it's uh, it's about actually the mountains are locked down. <laughs> they yeah, the Quebec and like Ottawa just all in lockdown. You can't see your neighbors, anything. They call the cops. It's it's really bad. Yeah, I know. Please yeah. give my regards to your parents. I have not seen them in a long time, but I do remember them fondly. They they were there last week, but my mom had a meeting because it's two oh. well, it two p.m. So she was working, so she, she couldn't make she text she well, texted. Right now, she's like, Oh, I'm gonna watch a recording. So <laughs> they're in Ontario now, yeah. They're up, in, they're up. yeah. No. Well, thank you for, for inquiring. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone else got another question? Yeah, I do. Hi, hello. Hi, Donna. Hi, hi. Yeah, my name is Donna. I'm from upstate New York, and I have a question. Upstate New York, yes, upstate. Not Jesus not... loved you anyway. <laughs> Where were you from in upstate New York? Well, just north of Albany, Cambridge. North of Albany, like Rensselaer, like yeah. Colony, Colony. Yeah, even Saratoga. I, Saratoga. Yeah, closer to Vermont, really. 
Oh, oh, oh Troy, oh, you're on I-90. Uh, I'm actually 87 north. Near the Adirondack, at the bottom of the Adirondack. Okay, I know where you are. Very country, not New Yorkish. Doesn't I know. Work. Yeah. Anyway, we're locked down. I've been locked down. I was, um, well, I don't want to get into my story, but my question is, you know, you talk about these uh, prophecies partially being fulfilled. Yes. And then the patterns that everybody talks about. Yes. And I wonder, I think about when Jesus came the first time, how so many people didn't see it. And, you know, we have the benefit of hindsight, right? Yes. But at the same time, you know, you say that the vaccine is not the mark of the beast. And, you know, I, I tend to agree. But then I got to ask myself, well, you know, that slippery slope of, you know, how do we know when it really is? Okay. The mark of the beast will not even necessarily be a currency. It may be, but it will not necessarily even be that. It will be a permit to be able to engage in commerce. This is the aspect that troubles me the most. <coughs> Revelation 13 highlights that it's necessary in order to trade or to engage in commerce. You can't buy or sell without it, okay? Mm -hmm. So what will happen if a supermarket or a vegetable shop or a butcher says you can't come in unless you have certification that you've been vaccinated, okay? <coughs> I'm not saying it's not a currency, but the emphasis in Revelation 13 is that it is a permit to, to engage in, in, in commerce, okay? When you have mandatory vaccinations, on this scale of this nature, and you begin telling commercial enterprises that they are required by law to check the ID and vaccination record of people uh, in order to go shopping in, in Walmart or whatever, okay? Uh, that shows you the way it's going, you understand? That shows you how the stage is being set for what will the mark of the beast is not going to be a big big leap it's not going to be a quantum leap it'll be yeah. progressive it'll be incremental and this is another stage in it now yeah, that, having that's said what, that yeah. having said that I oh, before the lockdown I used to go to Africa a lot and I have my immunization card you know uh, hepatitis B and the African yellow fever I, you know I I always kept a record of where I was, what I've been vaccinated for, depending on what country I was going to, where I was inoculated. I remember the first time it happened, I was in, I think it was Nicaragua somewhere. No, it was Guatemala after the earthquake. Okay. And you, since the 1950s, they've required school children in the United States, so since the early 60s at least, late 50s, to have polio vaccinations. Well, that, then, then it became sugar cubes. And diphtheria vaccinations, that you couldn't go to school unless, you, unless you'd been vaccinated as a little kid. Um, these things don't set a precedent, you understand? But it's the scope, the level. It's, it's, it's the level where it's everybody having to do it. That is what troubles me. But it's not the mark in itself. But when you've been telling people, you can't come shopping here, or you can't do this, you can't do that, unless you get this. <laughs> I hope that you have door-to-door -door delivery service like we have in England, where they'll bring the supermarket or bring the groceries to your house, otherwise you're not getting it. <laughs> I see. Well, thank you, Donna. Does that answer your question? No, not really. Diane, you're shaking your head. No, it, it, and you see what's what's worrying people at the minute is, I I know I agree with Jacob. It's not the mark of the beast because the beast is not on the scene, and he's the one that instigates the mark. 
but is it a process towards that and will that vaccination if you had it now count as part of that overall information pack do you see what i'm saying and jacob's just said now look it's not going to be a big thing i agree do you know what i think it might just only be let's say for instance another vaccination like we have flu every year oh dear we've got a coronavirus um mutation again we'll have to just twig it again yeah, but it's, and but we'll have to have it again it's specifically related to his name it's decipherable by isopsophy or by gematria. It's related to his name specifically. So what's this luciferase they're all going on about, about it being a biosphere that you can see through the skin than uh, anything that they tattoo? Okay. Does the, that... Uh, the subcutaneous technology, the subcutaneous technology uh, has been experimented with very heavily for the last 15 years, but it's been used on cattle for the last 25, 30 years uh, in their ears and things like that. Uh, and also pets, if you get a lost pet, again, it's incremental. It's progressive. It's not all of a sudden. Yeah. See, I I, I believe that God gives us doctors and scientists to, to keep us alive and to, to give us new uh, strategies for health and everything. But, like, we've just found out now we're at, at the, the Oxford Zeneca vaccine. One, the Daily Mail said three days ago it contained chicken egg cells, and a, a day ago it says it contains fetus cells. Well, that goes against everything we, we stand for as believers. I, mean I don't want a dead wait, wait, baby you, put in my mean, body. Do you mean fecal or fetal? Fetal. fetal, yeah, you know the fe the fetus, yeah, yeah, the baby's yeah. fetus, yeah. yeah. So we don't know who to believe, Jay. You know what? Again, it's complicated. I have no problem with stem cells. I have no problem with the use of embryonic tissue as long as it comes from placenta or from a baby that died naturally. It's when you kill the babies, abort them with no clinical warrant, and what? use the tissue. Then I got a problem. Well, this is the argument going on between Christians. Well, you, can harvest, you, know, you can harvest those cells from other places. It yeah, doesn't necessarily mean, mean, mean that it came from a aborted baby. But some of the, some of the body are, are absolutely adamant that it is from aborted babies, and the other half are not. So, yeah, no, and the scientists lie to you, so wild. who do we believe? These conspiracy theories run wild. Remember what Paul said? If you don't know the food is sacrificed to idols, just eat it and shut up. Yeah. <laughs> I think the reality just pray, is, you just pray over it and eat it, yeah. Now, I think the reality is for many of us that all these things are conditioning. They're all a means of getting us normalized. If you think back to uh, most of us here during the 60s, none of us had a credit card. None of us had a cash card. Mm -hmm. Then coming into the 70s and the 80s, those who were in the up and up had credit cards. Then came in the cash cards. But the cash cards, if you maybe had to sign for them, then it became the, the, the number, then it was a chip and pin. Now it's a contact, it was a swipe, and it was a contact. List. It's increments, it's changing, and that's it correct. becomes normalized. And that's the same with all situations that we are now involved in. The difference being, these things are happening so quickly. And if we look at every news organization throughout the world, whether it's ABC, CNN, BBC, they're already telling us, regardless of which Vaccine, you get this AstraZeneca, where you get the Pfizer one. It's not going to last very long. And with these new strains they're telling us about South African flu, Kent flu, it may not do. So it's already customing or a customer is mentally to prepare for yes. continuous processes of inoculations. And yes. if the mark of the beast is somehow in a similar fashion, people are going to go, that's fine, no problem, because you're yeah. already climatized to the environment. Yes. And that's the problem. It's a war of attrition. Unfortunately, yeah. the war is a lot quicker than we were all grown up to, and it's happening so quick. And the youngsters, the children who we all have, to them, it's a different world. They do not see the issues that we see. They don't see the moral, biblical, or even scientific problems that it may cause. Mm -hmm. And they're quite happy to take it. And that's the sad reality, is that the church yeah. has much to blame for this, I think, seriously. 
it's also synergistic potentially. What yeah. they say is you can't shop without this inoculation, but but the only payment we're going to accept is <laughs> this subcutaneous implantation. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, you better have that with most of the major airlines. <coughs> They're not able to fly unless they meet strict government guidelines. And insurance is one of the main caveats. So the country who's receiving you automatically has to check your passport. That's an international agreement with the aviation authorities. They have to verify the passport presented to them belongs to the person in seat 4A. Yes. But also, if you get onto that plane and you then pass on that condition to somebody else, they can sue you. And that's why they're risk averse. They do not want to have that. So that's their excuse. Is they can't fly, they can't get insurance. So to maintain the status quo, everybody will have a certificate that says, I was tested two weeks ago and I'm fine. Mm -hmm. but that that is that why people are getting nervous about this vaccination, though, because you can't buy. If I cannot go into the grocery that's store it. without that's my it. proof, but there's no yeah. beast, <clears throat> but I still can't buy or sell. So people are getting confused that's there, it. I think. That's yeah, it. yeah. It's incremental. Did I see Tim Clark? Tim Clark, the computer security guy. Is that you? It is. How are you? How's your dear wife? Uh, we're all well, thank you. We we recovered ourselves from COVID in November. So thank you for well. that thank thing a few weeks ago. I do appreciate it. No problem. No problem at all. Family's good now? Yeah, all good. All, all well, thank you. That's very good. I have a question if you can if you've got time. Go ahead, sir. Um, in uh, verses six and seven, it speaks of the sea coast. Um, I just wondered if you could expand on it. There seems to be some kind of uh, supernatural kind of uh, provision at the sea coast there. I uh, wondered if you could expand on a future um, um, sort of application for Israel and possibly also for the church as well. Okay, what it says is the decimation of the area south of Tel Aviv, okay, which includes Gaza and includes the port of. Uh, Ash, Ash, Ashdod and Ashkelon. It's, it's that area. Again, you have had partial fulfillments of that historically. There have been partial fulfillments of that historically. But it is very conspicuous and curious that that region is what is in play now. Most of the Katusha attacks on Israel come from there. Most of the Katusha attacks and probably most of the terrorist attacks are launched from that area. As far as the supernatural protection, I, I, I don't know. It, it just seems that the environment will be remade after destruction. But, do, you th do you think there's a, a future um, application for the church as well in this, um, as often is the case in, in, in the, this prophetic uh, sort of uh, way of looking at things? I would not associate geographical... I would, there are reasons you can associate Jerusalem sometimes with the church typologically, but I don't know of any reason why you can geographically associate that area of the Gaza Strip with the church. I can tell you this, the Arab Christians who live in Gaza have a terrible time and the media doesn't report it. Mm. Mm. Could, I, uh, could I elaborate on that question? Yes. Hello, Wayne, please do. Um, concerning concerning the destruction of Gaza, would would that would the Daniel ten Persian problem come into play there? Well, any the geographical area of Israel is so small that any any strategic attack, or even a tactical attack, is going to affect the whole nation. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So uh, just by virtue of uh, that you're dealing with a minuscule geographical radius, the answer would have to be yes, but there's nothing specific. Right. Okay. Okay, thank you, Wayne. Jacob, we hear act? tonight that Israel is not leading the vaccination campaign. They're way ahead of everybody else, followed behind by one of the Middle East states, then America and the UK. How concerned is Israel in relation to its population with the, uh, the COVID and its effects to weaken its defenses? Because Israel is going for an unprecedented fourth election in March, okay, because that's happening, there is an ultra-high politicization of the COVID crisis. That is the first thing. It, it is highly, highly politicized in Israel beyond the normal considerations of public health 
it is very much a hot political issue and it's a factor in the elections. So that's essentially what's happening. The other thing we have to understand is there are certain countries that are microcosms for marketing. They tend to be countries where a lot of people speak English or speak English. For instance, New Zealand, Israel, those are two countries that are used to test market things before they're put onto um, mass availability in larger countries like Australia, the States, Canada, Britain. It, it's known that New Zealand is a test market country. So is Israel a test market country because it's high tech and because so many people speak English. Um, th that is probably also a contributing factor. It is a test market environment <laughs> being used by pharmaceutical companies. Interesting, Jacob. Thank you very much for that. Has anyone asked any other questions on tonight's teaching? I have a question. Can you hear me? Hi, yeah. Helen. Hi. Okay, um, I've just been looking at verse 3. All you humble of the earth who have carried out his ordinances, seek righteousness, seek humility. And then it says, perhaps you will be hidden in the yes. day of the Lord's anger. It's perhaps that's where my question lies. Okay. In Hebrew, the connotation is that there is a possibility of it happening, that it doesn't have to happen to you, okay? That okay. it's going to happen, but it doesn't necessarily have to happen to you. It's a translational issue. Um, in modern Hebrew, you would say ulai, but in he, it, <laughs> it's hard to explain. In Semitic languages, it's also the way you pronounce things that determine the meaning of the word. Ulai, maybe, Ulai, yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oriental languages are like that, and it's, there's always a translation. Translation is as much an art as it is a science. Take my word for it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Helen. Good question. I was thinking the same thing myself. That yeah. phrase is used on several other occasions in the Old Testament, but it's an interesting question. Folks, before we close tonight, I would like to offer up some prayer in relation to the current situation in the U.S. While we've been on air, things have suddenly escalated to a real tragic situation in Washington. People have been shot. People have been storming buildings. The White House itself has come under fire, and it's getting crazy out there. And that really underlines the whole message of tonight, is that the Lord tells us these things are going to happen. And suddenly, out of the shadows... In the blink of an eye, these things happen. And it really undermines the fact that regardless of what's a bunker mentality or whatever, we have to prepare for the day and enjoy the day. Yesterday's gone. As it says in Matthew 6, tomorrow, forget about it. Deal with today. Deal with the here and now. Make sure that you are right with God because you don't know whether that proverbial bus comes around the corner or something else happens. In some places in the world, unfortunately, are more at risk than others. That's the reality. But situation in Washington tonight, those who are currently in the States, I don't know if you've been watching the local media feeds or whatever, but certainly things have gone a little bit mental there tonight in relation to the voting situation as regards the confirmation of Mr. Biden as uh, the president. So from what I've heard here in the UK, certainly shots have been fired, people have been shot, uh, the White House has been stormed, and the police and military have got a ring of steel around the White House, and the White House, not only is it in COVID lockdown, it's now in military lockdown. These things can be the precursor for a lot worse situations. Before we go tonight, I would just like, if anyone has got any prayer, anything they'd just like to bring to the table in relation to common sense, practicality, and the Lord's hand, and actually coming the savage breast and just bringing this quickly to a resolve. Well, I just... Bring us to you tonight, Lord, that we know that America, with all its faults and all its failings, Lord, it is the world's policeman. It's the world's bank. It's the world's um, litmus test for all sorts of things. And if America falls, Lord, then we know the dominoes of Europe and the rest of the Western world will quickly follow and chaos will quickly ensue. So we'll just ask, Lord, if this is of you tonight, this is the starting point. I don't know. But Lord, if it is, Lord, we can't pray against this. But we just ask, Lord, that the injury, the risk, that the, the hurt, the pain, 
the anxiety, Lord, is minimized. And for those who are injured tonight, Lord, those who are under the line of fire, the policemen, the military, Lord, that you will protect them and guide them, Lord. And if it is your will, Lord, that you will restore order to America and it will come out of this election situation, Lord, as best as it can, Lord, with people turning to you to go back to their Savior, to see common sense, to see practicality yes. and to see a way out. Because politicians, regardless of who they are, whatever flag they fly under, will ultimately fail and let us down. And we can see this, Lord, and no matter which country it is, they're but men and they will always come up short. So we'll just hand this over to you tonight to bring this situation to a quick and swift close, Lord, if it isn't your will. If it is your will, Lord, then we accept it. We move forward with the information that things may well get seriously worse, Lord. But that's the situation we have tonight, Lord. We just offer it up to you for your guidance and your protection, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Folks, we will see you again next week, the 13th of January, if the Lord tarries and allows us to be here. But thank you very much for your contribution tonight. And please do share the link RTN TV with your friends. We've got a few people tuning in tonight for the first time. We've got a lot of people on the live stream as well. So thank you very much. These are the things that are happening in the world today. These are the things that are happening at a pace that we can't control. If this is the only mechanism we have in keeping in contact with ourselves, call it the Christian underground, call it whatever you want to call it. We need to keep in contact with each other. And a sister contacted me this afternoon and she said, do we have a contact list? And the reason why we don't have a contact list is under data protection, certainly in the UK, it's not something that we can actually make public or make accessible to people as it currently stands. There may be ways around this under our um, conditions. We'll have to look at that. But I think certainly it may be worthwhile creating such a list or a separate list for people who want to get in contact with each other. But if you haven't done so, please subscribe to RTN, rtntv.org. That will then keep you in contact with us and anything you need to know, we will ensure you'll be kept appraised of what's happening, not just in the world, but also of good teaching as well. Not just the RTN, but with our sisters and brothers in Morial TV at ABT and with FBC, with John Haller, etc., and churches around the world. So please subscribe if you haven't done so already. We'll see you next week, Wednesday the 13th, God willing. Bless you all. Have a good night. Thanks, Amos. Thanks, Jacob. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Amos. Thank you. God bless you. We're praying for you. Thank you. God bless and thank you so much for making it available. For more information about Moriel, check out our website, www.moriel.org.